Hello, beautiful planet. Hello, citizens of the Earth. Hello, archangels in training. Welcome to this moment, a moment where we are brought together by the vibration of love, a moment that brings us together by the hands of time, and a moment where our most miraculous unfoldment occurs for the expansion of our light and the ascension of our world. Welcome to this moment and welcome to this transmission. I am Matt Kahn and as always it is an honor, a pleasure and a privilege to serve you. Now in today's transmission, obviously I'm just going to bring through whatever energies are here that want to speak through this space. As your subconscious minds let me know the words that need to be spoken, the teachings that need to be clarified for the healing you are processing and for the shifts and expansions you are ready to embody. And in today's transmission, along with answering some of your questions, I wanted to offer you some clarity on some very common misunderstandings we have along the spiritual journey. And by clarifying these misunderstandings, my intention and the gift I have for you today is that you don't have to spend an extraordinary amount of time, or my hope is that you don't spend any more time telling yourself what to do, secretly bullying yourself around, or trying to figure out how to force yourself to be the spirit that this path is actually helping you remember that you already are. A spirit whose light shines at the highest frequency, no matter your thoughts, no matter how often you're emotionally triggered, no matter the circumstances that seem to come your way, and no matter how different things are to the way you wish they were. Everything in your life is exactly the way it is for what you have decided you are ready to learn next, what you are ready to outgrow next, and what next state of expansion you're ready to enter next. But the frequency of your light can never dim or diminish. Your free will is determining the quality of your experience, but your freedom of will is not tainting or touching the frequency of your light. And while your light can always shine at higher frequencies, it doesn't mean that the choices you're making are dulling or diminishing that light in any way. And that's extraordinary news. So in the name of celebrating that you can always improve the quality of your experience, but you cannot use the power of personal will to dim or diminish the frequency of your light. What are the insights I can offer you today that can help free you of any self-imposed pressure? that can help interrupt any pattern of inner spiritual bullying, that can help you integrate the inner critic, and can help you not focus so much on whether you think you're having to work at doing it right or the fear of doing it wrong. Because the divine doesn't look at you and think of you as doing it wrong in any way. The divine is just helping you to explore your journey in the most authentic way. So the invitation of divinity is just to enter each moment as authentically as possible. And the more you remember that you are one with the divine, and the more that you're able to sense how much the divine is with you from the inside out, 
the more authentically you're able to be because you feel safe in the presence of your light. So let's start with the first clarification. The first clarification that could help you stop bullying yourself or telling yourself what to do or living under so much unnecessary spiritual pressure is that you don't have to spend your life watching your thoughts. I know that's a very common misconception that people think they have to watch their thoughts. And then, of course, the, the reason is people say, well, I have to watch my thoughts because I have to monitor the quality of my thoughts and I have to improve the quality of my thoughts. And especially if you have learned manifestation from a third dimensional perspective, you think the quality of your thoughts is reflective of the quality of circumstances you attract, which isn't actually true at all. And here in the fifth dimension, it's not about just learning the law of attraction, but learning about all the universal laws. And not looking at the law of attraction as some sort of egoic spiritual hack of how to stack the deck in your favor, but how to come into harmony with the way life is. And how to deepen your relationship with the divine. And knowing that what comes and goes in circumstance is not as important as how you learn to respond to it. But there's been this very mis the common misconception that you have to watch your thoughts. Watch your thoughts, Matt. Watch your thoughts. And I'm going to give you an analogy that can help free you of this. If you were driving a car, would you say to yourself, I have to watch the engine at all times that I'm driving the car so that I can tell the moment before the engine stops or breaks down? For if you were to watch the engine of the car, you wouldn't be paying attention to looking what's in front of you through the windshield and driving safely. And also, if you were focusing on the engine and trying to predict the moment that it stops, you also wouldn't be trusting the light on your dashboard, that if there was something going on with your engine, the light would turn on. And so to watch your thoughts too obsessively is like staring at the engine while trying to drive a car. And so it's no wonder why people on a spiritual journey who obsessively watch their thoughts feel unsafe. If you drove a car staring at your engine instead of facing forward, you would be driving unsafely as well. Also to keep in mind, watching your thoughts <clears throat> is not necessarily the most necessary tool when you are an empath. If we're talking about someone at a level of consciousness where a thought could tell them, hey, go harm that person over there, and they would do it, no question asked, that's the kind of person at the beginning stages of conscious evolution who should be aware of their thoughts. But the idea that you have to watch your thoughts and you have to make sure the quality of your thoughts are in alignment with the things you hope will happen is a bunch of spiritual gymnastics occurring in the spiritual neighborhood of your imagination. Because the real question becomes, how do you know whether the thoughts you're watching are yours or not? You may say, well, I'm thinking my thoughts, but in truth, you are not deciding, hey, I'm going to now think something really negative, and then you think something negative. You don't decide to have the thought and then think it. You become aware of the thought as it arises. So you aren't necessarily the thinker of the thoughts. You're just the one becoming aware of it, and that you assume I must have thought it if I'm the one who's aware of it. But because the mind is a processing center, and primarily because your energy field extends around you, what you're actually doing with your mind is transmuting mental clutter in the energy fields around you. You are, in fact, as an empath, a transmutation, an energetic transmutation vessel. And wherever you go, you're clearing the space like someone who would clear away weeds and brush to create a new path or walkway in the jungle. And you are in fact transmuting the mental clutter 
that is carried in the conditioning of not only your subconscious mind, but the subconscious minds of everyone around you and what you're hearing, whether it sounds like clutter, negotiation, fear, unprocessed pain, grief, you are clearing it out of your subconscious and the subconscious of those in the environment you're in and you're creating more space for the light of divinity to wake up in the mental area. Just the same way that what you're feeling emotionally is not emotions that always connect and belong to your history of pain. But in fact, you are processing emotions that is being cleared out of you and being cleared out of those around you. For you are helping the divine create space in the mental and emotional bodies of people around you to create more of a space for their consciousness to begin the process of awakening. And so if you've been taught to watch your thoughts, if you've been taught to track your thoughts and having to, oh, I have a negative thought, I've got to turn it into a positive thought, you're assuming that you're the one doing it. And to try to turn a negative thought into a positive thought is actually creating a sense of identification with the thought that then says, I want to make a home for that thought in my mental body. But your mental body is not an orphanage for thoughts. Your mental body is a space where mental energy is transmuted in yourself and others to make greater space for consciousness to awaken because consciousness awakens in the mind, consciousness awakens in the heart, and consciousness awakens in the gut. When the mind awakens in consciousness, you begin to think and conceive as the divine instead of as your history of pain. When consciousness awakens in your heart, you begin to feel your divinity and feel the divinity in others and feel the discernment of where to go and what to do without negotiation or the fear of missing out or loss. And when consciousness wakes up in your gut, you are able to feel your divinity as who you are. You're able to sense the divine within you in the bodies of others. And you no longer confuse other people's egos with who you are. You simply know other people's egos is their personal journey, but the light waking up in them is one with the light that I am. And so when you're having spiraling thoughts, when you're having obsessive thinking, when you're worried, when you're concerned, when you feel confused, your mental body, your mind is transmuting, not only in yourself, but around you, mental debris that is helping to clear more space for consciousness to awaken. So instead of tracking your thoughts and having to be a micromanager of your thoughts or thinking your job is to make sure every thought matches what you're trying to manifest, which isn't really even how manifestation works. Instead, you can just say when your mind is active in a way that bothers you, and all that means is your mind is in such an active state of transmuting mental karmic patterns around you that it's triggering your nervous system into a state of unease. And so when your nervous system gets disrupted by how powerfully your mental body is transmuting energy for yourself and for others, you can just say, thank you, mind for transmuting within me and everyone around me the mental energy that makes more space for consciousness to awaken. And as you hear me say that, can you feel your mind relax? Because when you speak like this to your mind, you're not only speaking as the divine that you are, but you're respecting the mind for the highest role it's playing. Just because other spiritual paths paint the mind as the enemy or paint the ego as the enemy doesn't take away from the fact that these parts of us are playing very high evolutionary roles within and for the divine. And part of what we're waking up out of in this ascension is needing to vilify what is actually the divine working in such collaboration and coordinated effort with all parts of itself. And just because people don't know how these parts work with one another, how they, just because people don't know that these parts are a part of, 
a bigger holistic system doesn't mean they're not fulfilling the highest role. And the more you talk to these parts in honor of their highest role, you're using your free will to give permission for these parts to reveal their highest role. So if you assume your mind is an enemy, it will reflect back to you what you say about it. If you assume your mind is helping you, it has your permission to show you its higher purpose. So again, you do not have to track your thoughts. And the fear is, if I don't track my thoughts, Matt, something bad's going to happen to me. But it isn't going to happen to you. Let me share with you a two-part statement that if you really let it into your heart will literally blow the doors off of old-school manifestation misconceptions. That which is meant to be cannot be avoided. That which is never meant to be cannot be conjured. I'll say that again. That which is meant to be cannot be avoided. That which isn't meant to be cannot be conjured, which means if something is meant to be, it is only going to occur at the moment it serves your highest evolutionary benefit. Your connection to the divine is not about trying to manipulate your way through this life and trying to say that if I can maximize pleasure and minimize pain, that means I'm a high vibe being. High vibe beings are not people that avoid catastrophe, inconvenience. High vibe beings are those that are the most adaptable and resilient and know that if a moment makes your heart explode with pleasure or if a moment debilitates you in pain, it is only breaking down old structures for newer expansions to be born. And that no matter whether you feel connected to life or as if you're doing it all alone. The divine is always carrying you from one moment to the next, ensuring that you will survive anything that happens to you, and that in the aftermath of surviving anything, it will always help you become an even higher version of yourself than the moment before it began. So that which is meant to be cannot be avoided. And that which is never meant to be cannot be conjured. So if something is not meant to be, you can't think negatively enough to conjure up what's not meant to be because your thoughts are not calling something to you or pushing anything away. Your thoughts are not pushing away pleasure and your thoughts are not calling pain to you. That's superstition. Superstition is what happens when spirituality is interpreted by imagination. The scary what ifs that simply distract you, like clouds that distract you from the sunlight of what is. That which is meant to be cannot be avoided. That which is never meant to be cannot be conjured. So when we surrender, we say, what will be will be, what will happen will happen, and the more connected I am to my heart, my breath, and the light of my divinity, the more adaptable I become, the more I see it through the eyes of Source, and the more I will allow it to help me become a greater, more expanded version of myself with less fear towards pain and less attachment towards pleasure, which is not going to make pain come more often and it's not going to make pleasure stay away for longer periods of time. Instead, you'll be in harmony with life where every breath you take can be bliss and elation, not just holding out for the experiences you prefer. And even moments of difficulty don't have to be insufferable. There can be pain, but there doesn't have to be suffering. As long as you're willing to say yes to what the divine within you has already said yes to. That which is meant to be can't be avoided and that which isn't meant to be cannot be conjured. And even when you have a desire towards something, the majority of the desires you have is simply your imagination trying to make a picture out of the way you want to feel. So if the, if the frequency you're meant to start aligning with is joy, 
to use my soon-to-be wife's name as an example. You may say, your ego may say, in order for me to experience joy, my life would have to change in this specific way. And unless it changes in this way, I can't imagine how my life would be joyful because your ego is always this mechanism and in its way of trying to regulate and normalize its reality, it's trying to make sense out of how you feel and what you perceive. So your ego is the one that says, the only way I could feel happiness, joy, freedom, and elation is if these things happen in this specific order. And then if life doesn't happen in that order, you think you've gone off course, you're not good at manifesting, or you don't trust the divine to guide you forward. But in fact, you're imagining what you want just to feel that frequency on an emotional level is always a frequency within you. And the more you start to get to know that frequency, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that that specific outcome is going to happen. It means it brings you into that frequency, that being at that frequency is going to bring you into a certain reality, a certain timeline, certain circumstances. And you'll be guaranteed to have more experiences of feeling that frequency as long as you can remain detached from how the outside will ebb and flow. And so just because we can say, okay, if I lived in a different house, I would feel ecstatic. Maybe we're only imagining that different house to get to know the ecstasy always within us. And maybe in that ecstasy, we'll have a house, a, a similar house, or maybe it won't even affect that area of our life. But we have to be able to use our mind as a tool and know that the desires we want are helping us to get to know a frequency within us. And what, will, what that will manifest is what's meant to be. And if we can trust what's meant to be without needing to micromanage what's meant to be by knowing the details of it in every single expression, then what's meant to be is going to actually make you feel more of that emotion, more happy, more elated, more fulfilled than if you just got what you wanted. Because part of the interesting paradox is if you got everything you wanted in the snap of a finger right now, you'd probably feel exactly the same as you do right now. And that would be a horrifying existential crisis. If you said, here's what I want, and it happened, and you felt exactly the same. Let's say you're sitting here saying, I'm worried I'm not going to meet my soulmate. Here's your soulmate. Now you're worried about disappointing them. Now you're worried about uh, them, them cheating on you. You're worried about maybe you're choosing the wrong one. And you go from worrying about not having to worrying about what you're afraid to lose or worrying about whether they're the right one. So you've gone from worry to worry. It didn't change the frequency. So what's more important in the laws of attraction is not actually the thing you're trying to make happen. It's about getting to know the frequencies that are bringing you into your next highest expansion. And that's why watching your thoughts is unnecessary for you. You're an empath. If a voice said, go harm that person, you wouldn't harm the person. You would just blame yourself for thinking such a negative thought, which wasn't even your thought. It was just a harmful thought that you are weed whacking out of the collective to clear harmful patterns and make more space for consciousness to awaken so all beings can be free, so all beings can be safe, and so that all beings who hurt don't hide from their healing journey by hurting more people. Feel this. Christine Coley says, got to stop worrying. I would say, let's not try to stop worry because that's fighting something that what is. Let's say, may the worry. In fact, in honor of Christine, what if we said this, Christine? I accept that the worry I feel is what my energy field is transmuting out of the collective. Thank you, energy field, for transmuting the worry in myself and others to allow more consciousness to grow and expand. Feel that. Another misconception that we can clarify so that you don't have to berate yourself and bully yourself spiritually is thinking, 
you always have to have your consciousness in a state of expansion. So if your consciousness was always in a state of expansion, or if you insisted it needed to be in a state of expansion, that's like you saying, I have to have a bigger, a wider windshield on my car to make sure I could see more. If your windshield extended beyond the frame of your car, you wouldn't see more because you're only going to see from within the space that is the frame of the car. It would just be extra glass that extended outwards that's gonna bump into more things. Or if you said, if I had bigger bigger glasses, let's say you had glasses that were this wide. If you remember seeing those glasses people sometimes wear? Like big glasses. And you said, if I have bigger glasses, I'm gonna see more out of my peripheral vision because it's wider. But wider glasses doesn't give you more peripheral vision. Your peripheral vision is only how your eyes scan back and forth in the frame of your face. So wider glasses wouldn't give you more peripheral vision. A wider windshield wouldn't help you see more around you. You're only meant to see what you're meant to see in the moment you're meant to see it. Consciousness isn't about demanding your consciousness stay in a state of expansion. Consciousness is about accepting that your awareness is like a dial and the universe is in charge of the dial. And the universe, when you surrender, allows you to see, I am looking at things up close. I'm seeing things from a state of expansion. And in every given moment, my consciousness is exactly dialed into the very frequency that helps me see what I need to see. Just because life is asking you to be open to expanded levels of awareness, just because life is asking you to be open to seeing things from a higher perspective, it doesn't mean that you have to obligate yourself to hold your consciousness in an expanded state all the time. That's not necessary. The universe is always working the dial. And the less you insist on thinking about things the same way all the time, and the less you insist on needing things to be one way all the time, you start to let go of this belief in control and you start to see your consciousness is always exactly showing you what you need to see. What is right in front of you is the only thing life is asking you to bring to your attention. And if there's something else you need to be aware of, it will pop up intuitively in your mind, if not appearing directly in front of you. So the rules of consciousness is much like watching a movie in a theater. If you want to know what's going to happen to the characters, you can't fast forward the movie when you're watching its premiere in the theater. You just sit in front of the screen, you face the screen, and you let the screen show you scene by scene what you're meant to reveal. And if there's something in the movie from the past you need to see, there will be a flashback scene. Much like if there's something from the past you need to remember or recall, it will come up intuitively. So what happens if we just relax and we don't try to work so hard to hold our consciousness in this state of expansion? What if you don't have to be one way all the time? What if you stop saying to yourself, I have to be constantly expanded, I have to watch my thoughts, and you have to do all of this spiritual gymnastics to make sure you get what you want? Because here's the hilarious realization. There are so many people in the world that have what you think you don't have, and they didn't do any of this work. Because that's not why things come and go. It may have been taught that way, It may have been oversimplified, and that might be a real marketable way to market it. But that doesn't make it true. It just makes it something easy to believe. And if you don't have what you want, and someone's telling you it's because you haven't done X, Y, and Z, and if you haven't done X, Y, and Z, you go, shit, that's why I don't have it. That's not why you don't have it. You don't have it because if you did have it, it would obsessively take up space in your awareness and it would probably be the next thing you give your power to instead of first reclaiming your power and learning to receive everything as gifts of worthiness. So the universe is also aware that you are going to have incredible gifts that come your way. You're going to have everything you want and more, whether it looks the way you want or not. But the universe is giving it to you in an order to make sure that as you receive all the gifts of desire, 
it's not being received at times where it will continue to disempower you and take away the power that you're reclaiming. So everything is occurring in a certain order to make sure you receive all the gifts you're meant to have and in a way that doesn't further disempower you. It's all happening for you. It's all happening through you. It's not happening to you. Feel that. If you don't have it, it's just not time yet. And if you ask yourself, what can I do to make it time? You're acting like the universe doesn't have a plan. You're acting like you need to sweet talk and seduce the universe as if God's a narcissist. It's not wrong that you don't have what you want. Because if you want what you want with enough intensity, it would distract you from the greater journey you're on. And if people are only going to act loving and heart-centered because they think that's the way they're going to bullshit the universe into giving them more gifts, you don't think the universe knows that as a disingenuous strategy of ego? The universe is your intelligence. And so far beyond the intelligence, the ego thinks it uses to manipulate and control. And if you're only trying to do the heart-centered work, to stack the deck in your favor. You can't fool the you that created it all as the quantum field. You can only come into greater harmony with the highest you that you are. The ego can make this into a game, but this is not a game. This is life. And life is real. The divine is real. Truth is real. Love is real. Therefore, life is real because it is that. And all shapes and forms are as real as the source dancing within and throughout it. And this is a field trip for souls learning how to be spirit guides and archangels in training. This is not an illusion, it's a field trip. You just have to make sure that when you're in the field, you're not tripping out too hard. And if you're thinking you have to watch your thoughts and do all the spiritual gymnastics and be this most pretend loving being to make sure you can manifest what you want, if you are under the illusion of that manipulative path of spirituality, guess what? You're in the field of reality, tripping pretty hard. And when you trip pretty hard on the spiritual path, words like this will sober you up and it will bring you back to reality. A reality that says that which is meant to be cannot be avoided and that which is not meant to be cannot be conjured. So let's perhaps stop negotiating and let's just return to this very moment. Take a deep breath and say, thank you, divinity, for always guiding me. Thank you, mind, for transmuting mental clutter in the world and in myself. Thank you, emotional body, for clearing emotional density in myself and the world. And thank you, the divine I am, for awakening the consciousness of all so that less and less people have to trip so hard in the field of reality. Feel that. Hmm. Another thing I'm going to share with you. A lot of us think we have to hold the feeling of love in our hearts. We have to hold love. I have to hold the frequency of love. No, you don't. And I'll tell you why. I'll give you a very technical answer as to why you're not meant to hold the vibration of love and to why it comes and goes so frequently and why it's not your fault. So let's think of it from the subconscious mind's point of view. The subconscious mind is here to help you orient in your reality. It's here as a fact finder, a meaning maker. 
it likes to compare, contrast, label, and count. So let's say your subconscious mind has been wired a certain way to based on the number of experiences you have with disempowerment. Let's say you have more files in your mind of experiencing disempowerment and less files in your subconscious mind for empowerment. That means that there's a greater number of disempowering files than there is empowering files, which doesn't mean you're going to always attract disempowering experiences, but that you're more likely to perceive and interpret and respond to that moment from a state of disempowerment. So when we start to rewire the subconscious mind, you have a moment of unconditional love. Maybe you say, I love you to your heart. And you feel that love expand inside of you. And your spiritual ego thinks, I have to hold the vibration. And I have to learn how to be this all the time. And you walk around the grocery store going, please, no one bump into me. I'm in. I'm holding my love. I'm holding the state. And then it goes away and you think, I must be in resistance. I must have done something wrong. And what the truth is, is that we don't understand how the subconscious mind works. So when you love yourself, you will feel an expansion of love. For some of us, we don't feel the emotion of love. We feel silence. We feel stillness. We feel emptiness. Because all, 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 how can I say this? We all come from different star systems before we came to this planet. None of us are from Earth. This is the field trip planet. We come from the Pleiades. We come from Sirius. We come from this place. We come from that place. Some of us come from parallel dimensions. Some of us come from places before dimensions were even created. And so when you experience love, you're experiencing love the way it's known from the perspective of your home planet. Some planets don't have emotional bodies, so you experience it as stillness or emptiness. And then if you think you're missing out, you'll think it's deficiency instead of just being so one with the light of the universe that there's no separation to feel it emotionally. But nonetheless, no matter how you feel it, emotionally or as silence or as stillness, it's all right. Let's say you feel that way and it goes away after a few seconds or a few minutes. That moment of love coming and going is counted by the subconscious mind as an incident. It's recorded. Then you go back to loving yourself later in the day, and that's a second incident, and then a third incident. And what's interesting is the subconscious mind will rewire to the vibration that you experience in small increments many times throughout the day or the week faster than if you just try to hold one emotion for a long period of time. Because even if you could hold love for a long period of time, the subconscious mind will count that as one. It does not count the length of time you spend in a state. It counts a beginning and an end as an incident. And so what we're looking for is not how long you can hold the state, but how many small incidents can we use to return to that state so that as the subconscious mind perceives, <clears throat> oh, love is coming, love is coming. And then all of a sudden the subconscious mind goes, if this love stuff keeps coming around, it must be familiar instead of foreign. And then it starts to welcome it with resonance instead of pushing it away as an enemy of the unknown. So you're not meant to actually experience these long drawn out states. If you experience it as a long drawn out state, it's because you're integrating it as a new sense of identity, which is fine. But if it comes and goes frequently, you're still racking up the incidences and it's the number of times you return to love that tells the subconscious mind, identify with this instead of your history of pain. Does that make sense? I think it does. I hope it makes sense to you because I think this is going to help a lot of you. So in the comments section, if you can let me know, how is everything that I'm sharing with you feeling to you? Martha says, such a cool convo. Sandy, that is so interesting. So when someone feels love for a moment, I follow. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Anne. When someone can feel just a little bit of peace and then it goes away, 
their subconscious mind counts that. And then I bring the person back to it and it counts it again. And that in the time I spend with someone, I might bring them back to that state five times and they walk away going, I failed to hold it five times. And I walk away saying I created five more files in their subconscious mind, which increases the likelihood that the next moments and the next day will start in that state instead of creating them into a character who craves that state. Makes total sense, perfectly timed. Totally agree, this makes total sense to me. All this is helpful, thank you, Matt. Bringing peace. Tierney says, I always make myself for wanting to be alone. I would, you know, to the best of your ability, I don't think blaming yourself for being alone is a bad thing. I think being alone is how some of us from different dimensional spaces and from different planets, that's how we recharge our energy. Because a lot of us that come from different planets, when we see other people, we begin to mirror their imprint in our field. And so sometimes we have to be totally alone so that we're mirroring ourselves instead of mirroring others. That's just how it works when you're from different planets and solar systems. Sivia, this is next level, Matt. I appreciate that. Makes so much sense, cousin Matt. Phil Kahn, nice name, Phil. Thanks, cousin. I didn't know I had a cousin, Phil. How cool is that? I must have timeline jumped and now I have a cousin, Phil. Everyone seems to be loving this. So again, I want to say this in a way just, just, just to make sure we're all kind of grokking this. When you're rewiring your subconscious mind, you're not trying to defeat an enemy. You're not trying to get rid of something because through the laws of the universe, that which created can't be uncreated. Transmutation, if I want to give you a definition of transmutation. So let's say you have a subconscious mind that has four files of abuse, right? Let's say you have four files of abuse in your subconscious mind. If I help you create five to eight to 12 files of the opposite vibration, that's telling the subconscious mind to identify with the files that has more incidences that is now bigger than the four abuses in your subconscious. And from a vibrational standpoint, the power of four abusive files in your mind is not anything close to the power of five empowering files in your mind. And so the idea that you have to get rid of the four abuse files and then replace them with positive files is not really how the subconscious mind is organized. What we want to learn how to do is just have more time introducing a new energy and the new energy and to know this, the positive energy is two to five times more powerful than the negative energy. So in truth, one to two extra files of empowerment has the capacity to transmute at least one file of disempowerment. So if you have four files of abuse and you start creating you know, each day one to three new files of encouragement, self-empowerment, forgiveness, and self-love, you are going to actually still be a person who survived your history of abuse, but you're going to begin identifying with the new files you're creating and not needing to focus all of your time and energy on unraveling the old files because the old files of abuse are things that already happened to you. What's more important is not going through those files and trying to redact it and white it out and write over new words. It's letting those files be something you've survived and just adding to the subconscious mind new files, introduce new experiences. And even if you feel the new energy for a split second, it started, it ended, it counted as a file. Now let's do it again. And how many new files can we create at the speed of love to start saying, yes, I'm the survivor of abuse. Yes, I've survived the harshest disempowerment, but I am learning to identify with the new energy I introduce that does not have to dismiss or deny 
what happened to me and what I survived. Does that make sense? Christine, writing, doing art therapy, positive stuff, affirmations. Yes, and that doesn't also mean that we deny the pain of our abuse. We don't bypass, nor do we obsess. We don't bypass, nor do we obsess. Instead, we use the files of abuse to say, what are the ways, the opposite ways I wish I was treated instead of the way I was treated? And what can I do for myself right now that becomes the course correction of what the past doesn't remember? What can I do right now to let myself know that I'm safe, even though I still remember how unsafe it was in the past? And as you start to create new files in your subconscious mind, your sense of safety will be found in the present moment, not a feeling of unsafety that keeps pulling you into the past or keeps you believing that the past is going to repeat itself. The fear that the past is going to repeat itself is when you have lingering files of trauma, but you haven't created enough new files to start to, to stack the deck and to, to shift things over into the new way. Danielle, if I'm present with painful emotions, I gather that also counts as a positive file. Yes, because when you are being present with a traumatic feeling, you are being the course corrective support. You are being the authority figure that the part of you from the past didn't have. You are being like the angel that is there rescuing you by holding you and witnessing you which is opposite from a moment in the past when someone overpowered you and no one was there to save you. So absolutely, very well put. Hmm. Tierney says, yes, because I have been resistant going to AA meetings lately, but I don't know why I have just one more time to myself. But I've been drawn to, but then I feel bad. Well, Tierney, you, you obviously are not going to those meetings and you're spending time alone because you know exactly what you need. So what if we just stop doubting that? And we say, thank you, divine I am for guiding me. Maybe you don't want to go to AA meetings because maybe the AA meetings is just spending too much time talking about the files of trauma in the past when just being alone and being empty is actually creating more files of moving you forward. Perhaps. And yes, this is so useful, love, new energy files. Christine, taking your little one by the hand. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for all of us that are coming to join me in person during this month of October for my East Coast tour in person, I'm going to be guiding because most events are going to be an intro evening and then a full day immersion. And even in cities that only have one event, at each event I'm doing, I'm going to be demonstrating and teaching a new karma clearing process. And what the karma clearing process is, is I'm going to help you to release the grip of identifying with those negative traumatic files and start to help you identify with the new files that we're also going to be creating at the event. So if you're coming to see me in person, if you have the ability to find your way to any of the cities on the East Coast, in person always creates the most potent energy. Obviously, if you can't, there's a live stream option for you. But what we're going to be doing, of course, I'm going to be channeling the teachings that are specific to everyone online and in the room. But the karma clearing techniques that I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it a little differently in every city because I know a lot of people are watching the whole tour on live stream, is we're going to do karma clearing. We're going to clear the patterns of ancestral karma, familial karma, societal karma, and even clearing the karma of the city in which each event is in and the cities of where people are attending via live stream. And by clearing the karmic patterns, it means I'm going to help you to break the pattern and cycle of identifying with pain so you can start identifying with the new files I'm going to also help you create at these events, such as the files I always help you create through every transmission that I offer you. So instead of being on a spiritual path and needing to obsess over your past and obsess over your past and throwing this process at it, this process at it, a lot of people will experience some relief, but they're still having an identity 
around their pain. And so a lot of us have this subconscious belief that says pain is how I know how to connect with myself. And if I don't have the pain of my past, I won't be connected. And so <clears throat> the process of karma clearing I'm going to help you with is to clear identi identification with traumas from your family, from your ancestry, and that swirling around in society so you can start building an identity with the light of your consciousness. You can start building an identity with the love of source. You can start building an identity with your higher self and continually create files that helps you to experience in your body the highest self that you are, the clearest connection to spirit, and the activation of all of your gifts. And this is why I'm doing an East Coast tour. Next fall, I'll be doing a West Coast tour. And I'm not sure I'm doing the karma clearing on the West Coast because by that time, I'll be taught a different process to do for humanity. But in the name of Earth's ascension, this is going to be one of the most compelling ways to learn how to be the most connected to source, to be on the highest timeline, and to embody the most amount of your light quotient frequency, no matter how the world is ebbing and flowing. And my spidey senses tell me that next year might be a little interesting for the collective. And so this is a way that I'm being asked by the Galactic Council to help prepare all light workers so we can come into our highest frequency, identify with our highest frequency. So as we hold space for the world, we don't have to get pushed around and pulled down as we hold space for the earth to awaken. And so please join me. There's a link. I believe it's the uh, top comment on this video. Please join me in person for my upcoming East Coast tour, whether in person or via live stream, and let's reverse the cycle of karma, and let's learn how to identify with our light, and let's stop making the spiritual journey about dumpster diving into darkness, and let's actually move into a new paradigm where spirituality is about getting to know our light getting to know our power, getting to know the love that we are as we hold space for the world to awaken into the remembrance of spirit. So please join me now in the comments, if you wouldn't mind, please one or a couple words describing how you feel from today's transmission. How do you feel? How, have you, how are you left feeling based on what I shared with you? Let's see what's said. Christina Light says, what's going to happen next year? We'll see. Graceful, lighter. Identifying with our light. Sad. Inspired. Much lighter than before. Empowered and uplifted. Thank you, Matt. Relief. Relief, I opened, encouraged, surrendered control. I love that. So for Diana, who says sad, just because I want, I, I'm always here to be of the highest service. When we feel sadness, two things are occurring. Sadness is what we're transmuting out of the collective, and sadness is also what our egos feel when it's letting go of control. So we would, we would like to believe that feeling the release of control feels like elation and bliss but because control is what the ego used to try to manage its reality to have its needs met it feel like it's, it feels like it's parting with its most important coping mechanism and so sadness is the feeling of the ego letting go of its grip of control and so sadness is a sacred feeling sadness says you are healing control right now and so may we love ourselves more not less and just before we end this transmission, is there a question that I can answer just so that I know that we have been served at the utmost highest level before I go pack my bags for the tour next week? And again, next year might be a little bumpy. Timelines are still being chosen for the collective. But just know, it's not a matter of what happens. Everything that happens in the world is actually moving us towards expanded consciousness. It's just we're experiencing what the world needs in order for the world to wake up. 
Any plans to come to Europe? Absolutely. That's in the plans. Maybe in the next two years, absolutely. So just remember, everything that's happened in your life is everything that you needed to wake up. What you're experiencing as the world is everything that the world needs to work to wake up. And so it can be a little bumpy. Bell Pony says, can you speak about service? That word triggers me. Well, what about that word? What about that word triggers you? I'd love to serve you and know that. What about the word service triggers you? Let's see if we get an answer. I'm feeling resentment like never before and trying to allow it, but feeling frustrated with how much time it's taking. So Verdalia, feeling resentment and trying to allow it, maybe the reason why you're feeling resentment is because you think you're supposed to allow it. You don't have to allow resentment. The universe is the one that allows resentment and the, and the universe has already allowed resentment because you're having experience of it. So the fact that you're experiencing resentment means the universe has already allowed it. You having to allow it doesn't actually do anything. That's just you trying to do spiritual obedience work. So why not just say, I have the right to feel resentful? Why is it less spiritual to, to say, I am currently in a state of resentment? If you say it in full consciousness, there's no charge and there's not you with the tendency of taking it out on another person. The reason we take it out on other people is because we're denying ourselves the right to feel it. So if you have the right to feel resentment, you're going to actually process it. Allowing it is simply what has already occurred because it was already allowed, which is why it showed up in your field of awareness. So what if you just said, I am feeling resentful right now. And it's okay that I'm feeling resentful. If there are action steps I need to take to minimize resentment, please show me where I give away my power. If this is just about feeling the feeling, I have a right to feel resentful. And if I'm making up stories about people and, and as the reason for my resentment, then so be it. Let me make up stories. Let me let this resentment have the biggest space to, to express itself in me. Feel what happens when you go there. Let's see. Bell says, as if I'm serving everyone else and not getting my needs met. I'm sure that's ego having a fat. Well, Bell, if you're not getting your needs met, the question is, what are the needs that other people aren't meeting and how can you begin meeting those right now? And the real question is, are you serving people with an expectation of them also meeting your needs? Because when we come from the purest place of service, we serve as a way of saying, I serve the person in front of me for they are an extension of the me from the past that wasn't served. So it's not as if people's experiences are reflecting what's off in you or what's not healed in you. What people are going through is a chance for you to serve that part of you going through whatever emotional issue they're going through as a course correction for how you weren't served in the past. So other people are a chance to serve ourselves as a way of course correcting our past or as a way of meeting other people's emotional wounds and treating them better than we were treated in the past to create more files of empowerment to stack the deck to be more files than the disempowering ones we've survived from the past. So I hope that helps. I hope that helps. Let's see. Doesn't serving people create more love files to outweigh the trauma files? It absolutely does. It certainly does. Ladislav, what about fear of fear? Fear of fear. Fear of fear is simply an energy called anticipation. It's not wrong to be afraid. It's okay to be afraid. You will not have bigger experiences in the absence of fear, and you won't have smaller experiences in the presence of fear. You're just fighting with the part of yourself that has a right to be. It's okay to be afraid, and it's okay to say to yourself, it's okay that you're afraid. I'm here to be with you and carry you through it. And that's the voice of God speaking as you, to you. So the you that's holding you and carrying you through the fear is actually the divine carrying itself through that experience. 
and you can feel the energy I'm transmitting. Betsy says, sometimes you channel energy through your eyes. Can you please describe what that feels like to you and explain how you understand it? it, it I just feel the energy coming through my eyes. I don't really have an understanding of it. I just know how to do it. I know how to gaze. And it's the infinity of source bringing light codes through this open space and being received, by, being received by the same space that dresses up as you. The appearance of me and the appearance of you is a costume party. And yet the energy being given and received is one. It's coming from source, it's going to source. And it's creating an alchemical reaction where everything is occurring in the play of life. And yet because it's come from source and going to source, Everything happens and nothing happens at the same moment. Welcome to the costume party. May I ask how to deal with loved one's reaction to my trauma? Well, everyone has a right to react to your trauma, including you. Some of your trauma will make other people feel unsafe, especially if they don't know how to make it go away, which isn't their job. So everyone has a right to react to your trauma, including you. And everyone's reaction is perfect for where they're at in their journey. It's just the intention from the universe is that you don't spend time trying to make your traumas okay for them and not being present with your traumas. Your, your invitation is to be fully present with your traumas and to let other people care for themselves. Other people will be able to support you in your traumas as they take the time to heal theirs. And if people can't be there for you the way you want them to be there for you, the intention is that you can focus on being there for you and not try to rescue others, hoping that once you rescue them, they can do a better job at rescuing you. Only you are here to be here with you. You're not here to make your traumas okay for any human being. You're just here to help share who you are so that each human being can be as honest with you as they are to themselves. And the key in every moment is that you're being the most honest with yourself and other people. That's how we maintain integrity. We re that's how we maintain integrity and congruence with the divine. Letting other people be as they are. And having respect for everyone's perception, level of consciousness. And taking the time to surround ourselves with people that are of the most positive influences for the pain we're processing, for the new files we're creating, and for the expansions we're going through and integrating. And I would also say, Christine says, that's right, if they don't respect your feelings then walk away, send them light. That is definitely an option. Or you can say to them, is there any way that you can speak to me or treat me in a way that feels more respectful for the experience I'm processing? And maybe you bring it to their attention. I don't, in my life, and I really have to have this conversation, but I don't like to tell someone this is what they're doing because that not, may not be their intention or they may not be aware. So I always frame it as a question. Is there any way that the way you're speaking to me or treating me can change to have more awareness for the traumas I'm healing and the experience I'm going through? Is there any way we can adjust this? And most people will say, oh, I didn't realize I was doing that. And you say, it's okay. But I, I'm just asking if we can adjust this so that we can both enjoy this moment. And I've even said to people, if you can adjust the tone of your voice, and if you can just adjust the way you're speaking to me, it will give me the greatest opportunity to receive all the value that you embody. 
And so the way I like to speak to people is to let them know that it's not as if I'm saying what they're saying, what they're doing is wrong. It's that it's prohibiting me from perceiving and receiving all of the value that they are here to embody. And if there's any way we can work together to adjust this experience, I will have an easier time perceiving your full value and receiving each gift that you embody. And when you speak to someone like that, it helps them to become aware with words of grace instead of always needing to create a boundary. You give someone a chance and you give them a chance to experience life at a different frequency of consciousness. And you give people a chance to be aware and you give people a chance to course correct without, with, without making them so defensive. And so I like to say to people, and again, I don't have to do this that often in my life, if we can adjust this experience, I'll have an easier time perceiving the full spectrum of your value and receiving all the gifts that you embody. And that's always one of the nicest ways to invite someone to contribute to adjusting the experience for everyone's benefit. And that's also a way that we teach people how they have the power to change and in a way that gives more gifts to the people they're with. It's a way that we build up people's self-worth while also being authentic to the needs we have. Hmm. So I hope that helps. I know it will help. And what a beautiful time. It is, it is as always it is, transmitting and connecting with you. Please join me for my upcoming East Coast tour. The link is under the top comment on this video, whether in person, I'd love to meet you in person or by live stream. Please join me for a rather groundbreaking adventure of clearing familial, ancestral, and societal karma so we can just focus our spiritual path on building new files and learning to identify with our light with our new expanded frequencies of consciousness, with respect for the traumas and hardships we've survived. We're not trying to outrun our traumas. We're not trying to erase our hardships. We're saying thank you for all that I've endured and survived. And may I work in oneness with the divine to co-create a reality that turns disempowerment into something more meaningful for myself and the world. I'm holding space as it awakens. Until we come together next time, I am Matt Khan bowing in your presence, adoring your divinity, cherishing your light, and serving you in the name of love. Namaste.